welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and we are continuing our important discussion around gun violence in our schools with great advocates who are pushing to make our schools and children safer. My special guests today are Lori Aladef, CEO and Vice Chair of the Board at Make Our Schools Safe in Florida, and Dr. Ilan Aladef, uh, COO and Chair of the Board at Make Our Schools Safe in Florida. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and the work of your organization with us. You tragically lost your daughter, Alyssa, during the 2018 mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. And uh, that day, 17 people were murdered, another 17 were injured. We really, we really extend our, our sympathies uh, to you and are so grateful for your advocacy. Um, we just had a discussion, Lori, with some others um, on, on this, this whole topic. In the last 28 uh, months, 28 months, 28 months, there have been 65 schools shootings in 24 states. Our country leads the world in gun injuries and death. About 200 Americans are shot and injured by guns every day, which is well over 70,000, with about 40 to 45,000 individuals killed uh, every year. Lori, Ilan, uh, could you talk a little bit about how your organization, Make Our Schools Safe, approaches this issue and how you think about this issue? Um, could, you, could you give us a sense of how we can change? Sure, Mark. I'll start first. Thank you for having us here today. And I just want to take a moment to honor and remember our daughter, Alyssa, who was tragically killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Alyssa was only 14 years old and she was shot eight times in our English classroom. So we turned our, our grief and pain into action and we started Make Our School Safe. And we believe that we can go about preventing school shootings in creating different layers of school safety protection. protection. For example, behavioral threat assessments in schools that are done with law enforcement and mental health counselors help provide wraparound services for students. Also, see something, say something, prevent violence from happening before it happens. Kids know, they know what's going on on their Snapchat and Instagram and have parents um, watch their social media, know their passwords and report something through something like the Safer Watch app, for example, to prevent tragedy from happening before it happens. There's also things like ammunition sniffing dogs that can randomly go into schools, identify if there is a gun in someone's backpack, um, random metal detector wanding for students' backpacks. There's school hardening measures like fencing, ballistic glass, cameras, gun detection cameras. And it's really important that there's training. We need to make sure our students and teachers are very much prepared to be able to scenario-based train and use plain speak language in in their training. So they know exactly what to do if there is a life-threatening emergency situation. Um, and I wanna also, and then I'm gonna hand it off to Elon to talk about Alyssa's law, but parents also, they need to be the first line of defense. They need to check their kids' backpacks and make sure that they are not having, you know, guns, knives in their backpacks. We need help. And also importantly, make sure that their guns at home are appropriate, appropriately locked up. So handing off to you, Elon, to talk about Alyssa's Law. Well, let's, before, before we do that, Elon, I'd like to take advantage of your background as a medical doctor because any doctor, any medical doctor starts off with a diagnosis, right? They start off with trying to understand the sources of the problem. And one of the things that strikes me about all the measures that Lori um, un uh, unpacked there is that there is a diagnosis that, that you have made in terms of where these school shootings are coming from, who is doing them, right, and how they transpire. Because all of your actions tie to things like young people themselves getting access, being the perpetrators, getting access to guns and coming in and 
and taking those actions. Could you talk a little bit about how you think about the problem before it occurs? Who is the source? What is the cause? Um, And and then let's talk uh, a little bit about the various uh, measures that were unpacked by Lori. And I do want to get to Alyssa's law. One of the things that I think about when when we talk about diagnoses is that there's a significant mental health problem that exists across the country. And what we know is that there's really no cure for mental health, but there's different types of mental health diseases that, that really fall in that range. So for example, there are obviously those that are personally disturbed for various reasons, and then there are those that are driven to that place. So for example, we know that in uh, cases where people have been bullied or uh, pushed to the uh, their last, as you say, their last uh, willpower, and they have to then react, there are preventative measures that could be taken for that. So, you know, there are those that have schizophrenia and hallucinations and oppositional defiant disorder and well, those things are not necessarily fixable. So what and you're saying that, is, is that within a school environment, if, you, if you're talking about 500 kids in a school or 1,000 kids in a school or, or 1,500 kids in a school, there are going to be a certain population who are particularly sensitive to, to mental health issues and to trauma that might be coming in from the home or might be a part of a, of a chemical thing that's going on. You already know before the the bell rings to start the school day that there are a certain number of kids on campus that need help. And and you're saying that, you know, we need to start off by thinking about that, about about that issue, because if somebody is in that kind of distress and they have access to to weapons, then tragedy can occur. So that's that's exactly correct. And when we think about that. Obviously, you know, there's the ones that are inherently have some underlying mental illness. There are those that are driven to mental illness. And then there are those that uh, unfortunately are exposed to, let's say, the wrong element on a given day, uh, whether it's with gangs and other types of violent measures. So when I think about those different categories, you know, obviously you, there's no one treatment that that is going to fix it all. So, you know, you have to break out those different types and try to figure out how you're going to address each type. Now, there's obviously ways of addressing mental health and mental illnesses in various capacities. Each uh, medicine, if you will, doesn't necessarily treat it all, but you also have to look at it from other perspectives. Well, Lori mentioned it pretty well, which is access, access to weapons. Right? How do we mitigate access to weapons uh, or prevent access to weapons? And then more importantly, how do we prevent it from actually entering our buildings? And if you think about it this way, an airport does it really well. They prevent access of weapons from getting into our airports uh, and also our governmental buildings. But yet our schools, unfortunately, are not as protected. And that's part of the concern. And that's one of the reasons that these continue to happen in schools. And, Very and, soft. and what you're saying is that if we're going to have uh, handguns be so plentiful in this country, there are repercussions downstream in terms of what we need to do. We need to then create secure spaces for our students, right? If, if, if handguns are going to be ubiquitous, which they are in this country, we must spend money on securing schools. And that's, Lori, your, your point about uh, safe spaces, bulletproof uh, glass, and so on and so forth. I mean, that's all part of the expense that kind of gets built in. Yes, and we actually have a federal bill called the Safer Schools Act, HR 2717, and the, that allows schools to do a school safety risk assessment on their school and based on its vulnerabilities, they would then be able to apply for federal funding to fix those vulnerabilities. 
Uh, so it is uh, a source of funding that uh, we are working really hard at Make Our School Safe to pass as a federal bill. So every school across the country would have funding to be able to fund these uh, risks at their schools. Now, would, would, would you think that, that if, if the reason why you're hardening schools is because of the ubiquity of guns, does that lead some sort of a connection between taxing guns in order to fund school safety um, within the, this sort of hardening kind of a kind of a situation? Is that where we're going? Where in order to have guns be uh, so ubiquitous and, and uh, freely sold and so on and so forth, and if that requires a certain amount of hardening in, in our public schools, then does the funding get get funded by the public purse, or does it get funded by particular taxes? You see this in cigarettes, for example, where cigarette tax is designated to certain health um, uh, 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 funding. Um, is that the kind of thing that you're seeing coming down the pike in a way that protects rights, but also deals with the downstream costs of the harm of, uh, of exercising those rights? How do you see it? You know, I'll be honest from a... Uh medical perspective, but really from a public health perspective, I feel like it has become more of a political issue than anything else. It's not really focusing on the health and the well-being of our populations. We're really focusing on political opinions. And the second that you talk about anything related to guns and weapons, it's really you're, you're dividing the population immediately. You got your right and left sides and they're battling and they're not getting a lot of stuff done. I got to be honest because we continue to see the same things happening over time. And I think that's where our foundation has chosen to go a different route. When we think about gun violence in our schools, we think about it from a three-prong approach, right, prevention. And Lori really has done a nice job in describing some of the things that we do in terms of prevention. Then we talk about mitigation, which uh, Alyssa's alert can definitely help and also stop the bleed kits that we, uh, that we do within our foundation and we provide that resources for our schools. And then there is the recovery, which is all about psychotrauma training and how do you provide resources to the, to the direct, of, uh, those that are directly affected as well as its community. So we talk about in strokes, there's a penumbra, which are the parts of the brain that's affected in, after a stroke and that can cause damage. Well, we, in, in these types of episodes and trauma, the penumbra is really our communities, those that have been directly impacted. And we see that over and over again because after the shooting's over, there's a lot of mental health issues that, that go on. And we see a lot of suicides uh, from community members in various forms. And unfortunately, one of, uh, one of our daughter's friends uh, took his own life. So we know that this is on uh, an unfortunate outcome. So we look at it from a three-pronged approach and our foundation, Make Our School Safe, has really tried to focus on things that we can control because while politics are at bay, we're not making much progress, what are the things that we can do? The status quo is just not acceptable. So tactically, that's, that's so interesting. So tactically, you're not taking this step where we can get into unproductive conversations that are based in in cultural politics and so on and so forth, right? You're basically focusing on solutions that can be enacted where, you know, we, you can basically deal on that basis, avoid, duck the, the cultural nonsense that we get into in this country and instead look at real measures that will, that will protect your child if you're a uh, total right-wing conservative and our total left-wing liberal, it's going to protect our children regardless. That's how, that's how you're, you're doing this. Go, go ahead, Lori. Yeah, so definitely Alyssa's law was passed here in Florida with $8 billion allocated to implement the law, which is a panic button in schools. So if there is a life-threatening emergency situation, whether it's a medical emergency or an active shooter situation, the teacher can push a button whether it's an app on their phone, something would they wear around their neck or a hardwired button. And it's directly linked to law enforcement and the 911 center all at the same time within seconds. 
and Alyssa's law was passed unanimously, Republican or Democrat, here in the state of Florida. So this is something that we all see as a top priority. Panic buttons is something that we've had in our banks for years. And in our schools, it is something that we wanna see as a standard level of school safety protection in all schools across the country. And, and I, I looked at your website and it looks like you've had a series of wins. And the thing that struck me is that there wasn't a pattern of red state or blue state. It was, it was across different states. You know, when we, when we look at it, um, the nice thing about it is when we, we start talking about children and teachers, and we keep 100% of the audience when we talk about that. Republican, Democrat, doesn't really matter. Each one of them has children. They have children in their lives in some capacity, whether it's their own children, their family's children, or friends' children. And many of them have teachers in their families or no teachers. So it doesn't really matter what political affiliation you hold near and dear to your heart. It's about saving the lives of children and staff. And I'll tell you what's interesting about Alyssa's law, and Laurie mentioned this, uh, in Naples, uh, or just outside Naples, in the beginning of the year after Alyssa's law was enacted, uh, a 17-year-old girl suddenly collapsed. And the teacher described it as she, she turned four shades of gray and was dying in front of her. And this just out of the blue. And what happened was it took 22 minutes, from what I recall, for EMS to get there. Now, that child would have been dead. If it was not for Alyssa's law and Alyssa's alert, uh, another teacher came running down the hall with an AED and shocked the child, brought the child back to life. She was eventually intubated, put on a respirator, and eventually extubated and made a full recovery. But that child would, no, would not be here if it was not for Alyssa's law and the panic button. And so the secondary benefits of having the panic alerts clearly are there from a medical standpoint. And it's something that we're looking at now in hospitals as well on how we can bring necessary awareness to it, an immediate issue. You know, in hospitals, we might say code blue uh, and there's an alert that, uh, you know, addresses, gets people to the right place. But when you have to call a 911 switchboard that's already overtaxed, under-resourced, it's really hard to, to get to the right people. And time is a person's life in these types of situations. They have them in government buildings, they have them in jewelry stores, they have them in banks. Well, it's time they have them in schools nationwide. I love the, the tactics, the tactic of, of avoiding um, what can be avoided in order to get something done. I love the self-discipline that you've imposed on yourself. Rather than scoring points, you're scoring wins. And that's so important if we're going to change the country. Lori, did you want to say something? I just wanted to add that once that button is pushed, it's called geofence to the area. So sort of like when you order an Uber, the Uber knows exactly where you are and where to pick you up. It's the same thing with Alyssa's alert. The Once that button is pushed and it goes directly to law enforcement, they can see exactly where the button was pushed from. And then they can pull up their cameras, they can get eyes on the scene, and then be able to direct their SRO exactly where to go to help take down the threat. Now, um, on your mental health point, we just completed a poll. It's, it's interesting. We asked, uh, does your local school provide mental health resources and training in an effort to prevent violence in schools? And we got 20% said yes, 20% said no, but most people don't, don't know. Um, which, which is kind of an indictment. We should know, right? And then the, uh, we got 100% uh, response on should tax dollars go to funding mental health services in schools, which I'm, I'm just very gratified because I think that that point that you made about the fact that, that we do have kids who are in need, I mean, we, we should all be there for, for, for kids. It doesn't matter if there are kids or not our kids, right? We should be there as a community for our kids. So that, that, that's a wonderful thing, right? Uh, and, and we don't really do that enough. So is part of what you're doing when, when you're interacting with people, even on, on non-specific things like Alyssa's Law, which is very specific, right? Very detail-oriented. Are you encouraging people to think a little bit differently than they have been in the past um, in order to, uh, to shape the dialogue amongst people so that before it even gets to this, this um, 
this terrible act that you're actually shifting the school environment in a way that is that goes beyond a particular uh, piece of legislation just by changing the way people discuss it oh i definitely think through behavioral threat assessments you know when there is like someone says they're going to shoot up a school and the school does a behavioral threat assessment they're bringing in a mental health counselor into that conversation they're bringing in law enforcement and the teacher and an administrator into that conversation to determine what level of threat is this? Is this a high threat? Is this a transient threat? And and then based on the outcome of that behavioral threat assessment, then the school can determine what wraparound services and needs, mental health needs might be for that student. And then it's made, and then it's that next step to make sure that those services are actually given and provided to the student. And this could be done in the school, but that maybe the student needs more and for us to be able to reach out to outside partners to help us come in and to be able to meet the mental health needs of our students. You know, um, you touched on a a topic that we haven't really dealt with, and that is the whole idea of of keeping firearms safe and the responsibility of, of parents and friends um, you know, if you say if you see something, say something. That whole that whole idea. And there's there have been some movements in legislation to uh, hold parents criminally responsible. Uh, do you have any thoughts on those kinds of, of of approaches? Do you have a particular approach that you think is something that can be systematized rather than just sort of casually say, "Well, you should do the right thing," right? Uh, is there is there a way? short of creating um, uh, some sort of a law, is there is there a way that we- So we did pass a law called the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act after the shooting, we helped pass it, which requires Fortify Florida. It's see something, say something, an app. It's on every student's computer across the state of Florida. So that if they want to report something as themselves or anonymously, they can do that. And we are getting information on threats and vetting them out. Some of them really real and some of them not so much. But this is absolutely something that could be done through legislation like we did here in Florida. Um, But we need to continue to push that it is appropriate and responsible if you do see something to say something. So, you know, one thing I I would throw out, though, is, you know, just thinking about the benefits. So uh, I like to tell this story, though Lori always gets upset with me when I do, but I'm still going to do it anyway, which is, uh, you know, after the shooting, a a child uh, was concerned about his friend his friend was thinking about committing suicide. And instead of reporting it on the app, uh, the child reached out to Lori and Lori reported it on the app and actually got the resources to the child and saved that kid's life. This is a great example uh, of prevention methods that really need to take place. And we definitely need to systematize it. The, the, the question of whether, you know, who do you hold responsible? You know, again, I, I, I think that starts entering into the, political realm uh, of questions and, you know, who makes those decisions. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, my personal views may may vary from or differ from many of the legislators out there, depending on what side of the aisle you're on in any given moment. And I think that's part of the problem. We're not looking at trying to create solutions. We're looking at uh, just necessarily being right. And each person has their own point of view. And rather than thinking about societal health, uh, from a different point of view. So it definitely is a challenge and one that limits ability to get solutions done. Well, you know, you're, you're talking about a very big issue in America, right? Between individual liberty and the right to, to, of the individual to do as they want and the rights of the group. And, and I think that there's a way to not see this as diametrically opposite or in opposition. And that's what you're saying, Elon. You're saying that hey, you know, everybody needs help sometime. And that's what society is there for. We're, we're actually, we have a social compact in this country. Um, and everybody also has the right to some privacy and, and some and individuality. Um, there's, there, there's not a hard and fast rule. If you see somebody in distress, they might 
in their individual rights say I have I have the right to to do whatever I want. But, you know, society also has has this other. So it's in dialogue, isn't it? But I just you know, don't want to say. Oh. Sorry, Lord. The same thing happened, though, if if you think about with with COVID and mask use. And again, it became a very pol- uh, politicized term. But the question we always have to ask is, when does one person's civil liberties outweigh another person's? And honestly, I, you know, that's the challenge that you always have. You're always butting up against. Lori? Sorry, Lori. When, but when parents are irresponsible and leave their gun on the sofa and it's not locked up and their child takes that gun and brings it to school, that's unacceptable. And we have to focus on making sure that parents appropriately and responsibly lock up their guns so their kids do not have access to them. Yeah. So so what you're saying, Lori, is that is that we really do need to look at the individual details. And if the individual details are indicative of a pattern of behavior that places other children in danger, right, then you have to go back to the source. It could be the child as a source. It could be the parent as a source. You really just have to take each case and the facts of each case individually. And, and let's, let's use some common sense, right? You know, if I can uh, just speak to an analogy, what happens if a child decides to have a party with alcohol in it uh, at a house uh, and someone gets hurt as a result of that? Are the, the owners of the house, which are typically the parents, are they not held liable? Well, is this thing different perhaps? You know, and it raises similarities to, it raises questions to these similarities. But, you know, again, I always think of, there, there has to be some responsibility and accountability and parameters by which we operate. The same, same reason is you drive a car, there's clearly rules of the road that have to be followed. And the expectation is that every person, when they get a driver's license and get, a, get behind the vehicle, they're going to follow those rules. And there are consequences when, they're, when those rules are not followed. So why is this any different? Lori, I'm going to give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our end of our time. What can we do? What can I do? To Please make- join the school safety movement. Go to makeourschoolsafe.org. Sign up for our email blast. Follow us on our social media. Make a donation or volunteer. We would love to have you be a part of our school safety movement by going to makeourschoolsafe.org. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Elon. And uh, I do want to point out that our just completed poll, there was unanimous um, view that we can actually reduce schools to shooting. Everybody, everybody who responded said, yes, we can uh, make our schools safer. Lori Aladef, CEO and Vice Chair of the Board at Make Our Schools Safe, and Dr. Elon Aladef, COO and Board Chair at Make Our Schools Safe, and Melissa Aladef, who is the person who is not here today, for whom this legislation is is named. Thank you all for your work to make our schools safe. Um, Everybody else, please be safe. Um, Attendees, thank you so much for your questions and for your contributions. Uh, We are going to, on Thursday, be talking about an associated uh, issue, uh, maternal health, and uh, in, in, in particular, uh, mental health of, of, of mothers as they struggle through um, through the um, experience of being uh, good mothers. Uh, that's going to come on Thursday. Uh, thank you both, Lori, Elon. Thank you so much.